This morning we're talking about do you have room. From Luke chapter 2, Matthew and Luke gives us the accounts of the birth of Jesus. And of course, uh, as prophesied by the prophets, it was in Bethlehem, born to a virgin of the, of the lineage of David. Um, and, and there's a lot of information in, 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 in Scripture in and around the birth of Jesus. But between Matthew and Luke, we get the, the, the most full account of, of Jesus' birth. But from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it came to pass in that day, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It becomes the the, the great story of, of, of the Christmas of Jesus' birth. How when they came to Bethlehem, of course, everybody and their brothers come to town because they're required to register for, 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 the, for the census and, and for the upcoming taxes. So instead of Joseph leaving Mary back home in Nazareth, he takes her with him, even though she is very far along in her pregnancy. But while they were there, there just wasn't any place to stay, you know. So they wind up in, 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 in a stable or in a manger, um, and uh, that is where Jesus was born. The king of the earth, born in the most humble circumstances. Now, some of you have, have probably can, can lay claim to fame that you were born at home. My mom was born in a log cabin that her father had built. She was delivered at home by her grandmother. Her grandmother was a midwife, and my mother was born in a log cabin. Some of you may have been born at home, but I dare to say I don't think anyone here says I was born in a barn. Now, your parents may have suggested you were raised in one or asked if you were raised in one, but I don't think anyone here was born quite that humble. Be born in a stable. Because there is no room for him. You know, we still struggle with this today. It seems as if the world struggles to find room for Jesus today. Uh, Tammy and I were watching a, a Christmas film. We, we, it was a Christmas movie on. We're going to watch it, okay? We wear the Hallmark Channel out and we wear some of the other ones out. Some of you shaking heads, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we've seen them over and over again. Like we, we like, not, like when don't know what's going to happen. We've seen them so many times and stuff like that. But that's just something that we do. We were watching one the other night, and, and, and they were singing the song, Go Tell on the Mountain. But they've specifically let it out. They left out the word that Jesus Christ was born. They were saying, that, you, know, you know, go tell them that, that he is born. And, I think, you know, and they had to stretch that out and make the syllables fit because they left out the word that Jesus Christ is born. And it caught both of us. They said, why did they leave that out for? I mean, that's the song, go to, that Jesus Christ is born. Why do they do that? And, and it, it seems that there's more and more of that. And I, and I find that, that it's almost every, every time I'm in town today or, or this past few weeks making purchases, it's like people intentionally, have a Merry Christmas. I mean, they really, really mean it. It's like, you know, we're being rebels. Like we're saying, have a Merry Christmas. It's a struggle that we have. Have you noticed, and this is something that was brought to my sensitivities a long time ago, and I just don't do it. Instead of saying Christmas, people put Xmas. And it's becoming, seems to be more and more popular to do that. Now, I know that there's some background behind that. That the X is, the X that we see as an X is taken originally from, from the, the, the Greek letter that stood for Chi. And so that was representatives of Christos for Jesus. And so people sort of shorten it. It's like a shorthand version of it many years ago. But today, I really do feel like it's trying to take Christ out of Christmas. And so this was a poem I came across. I just sort of liked it. It's a small text, so I'll read it to you. Let's take the X out of Christmas and let's put Christ in again. The day is the birthday of a king. Not that of an unknown man. The tinsel, the glitter, the glamour, the noise, the parties gay have all but obscured the reason that we celebrate the day. We surely wouldn't write Exion for Christians here on earth. 
then why do many write Christmas, Xmas, for the day of the Savior's birth? It's an honor that's really due him or that a common name. Let's, so let's take the X out of Christmas and let's put Christ in again. And I think that's really the, the challenge we have. If Christians don't stand up for, stand up for Christ, who will? If we as believers, as we as believers don't stand up for him, who will? Three points. And I've substituted the X just to tell you how irritating it is. We need to examine the excitement that keeps Christ out. I think sometimes we get so wrapped up and, and, and so overwrought with, with the activities of the season that we sort of leave out the main reason for the season, that, that, that we sort of get somewhat distracted by it. And I know growing up, many of us were told that we didn't know the day, exact day Jesus was born, so maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe we shouldn't put so much emphasis on it. But I think the time is now and the culture we live in, if we as Christians don't recognize Jesus, whenever and every opportunity that we have, if we don't do that, we're missing an opportunity. Because there's only a few times in the year that the world will slow down and even begin to acknowledge Jesus. And we as Christians need to stand in that moment and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And we need to be proud of the name that we wear. So I think the challenge we have is, is like, like what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That is, set Jesus aside in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone and ask you the reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. That we should be people as, as Christians who have set Jesus aside in their hearts. That above and beyond all else, he should have the most special place in our hearts. See, that was the same word that we used that talked about the temple vessels that were used, that they, they would wash them with water and they'd wash them and would sprinkle them with blood. And once they were purified for that purpose, they were to be only used for, in, in place for the temple. They were sanctified for a purpose. They were set apart for the purpose. And we are, should have a portion of our heart that, that ex- exclusively belongs to Jesus. If it takes a season or opportunity of the year to do that, then, then so be it. But as Christians, we try to do that all the time, right? You know, we, we come together on the first day of the week in order that we may remember his death, burial, and resurrection, but most importantly, also his life and his sacrifice for us. We should be able to not let the excesses get in the way of what's most important. Need to focus on Jesus. Number two, exclude the excesses that keep Christ out. Mark chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus asked this. He says, why it profits a person if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? I think some people put more emphasis in planning and in getting ready for the holiday than they do in getting ready for Jesus. They they are so thoughtful in the gifts they choose, the the, the things they do. So thoughtful and and so much effort is put into it. And and some of you in in, in this week (laughs) will discover all that effort you went into it. You know, all the gift buying and and, and wrapping. and, and, And then in a few moments, it's over. It's over. Now, when I grew up, I guess there was you know, five kids and, and mom and dad. I remember Christmas. It was chaos. I mean, the, we didn't wait for each other. We just tore into it. You know, and it was it was just chaos and stuff. You know, we're much more disciplined than that, that now. You know, we, we we you know we we savor the moment. We we drag it as long as we ever, everyone does it one at a time, so we can savor the moment. Okay. But, you know, so much effort goes into this that we don't always even do the same amount of effort in thinking about Christ. And Jesus says, listen, if you, if you get everything that you ask for, if you get everything that you ask for and you lose your soul, what have you really gained? 
And the big picture, you know, and, and the ultimate picture that there is a God who loves us and a Savior who died for us, who wants more than anything to bless us in this life and the life to come. But yet we can get so focused on the wrong things. We get so focused on the material things, so focused on the things that really in the big picture do not matter. Jesus says you can lose your whole soul over that. And then really, what do you have? What do you really, really have. See, sometimes we need to look at things from heaven's perspective and not from earth's perspective because earth's perspective is broken. The world's broken because of sin. It was cursed because of sin. We're preparing for the lesson as a reminder of the story. I've shared it with you before <clears throat> about the rich man who died and got to heaven with his luggage. Uh, and, and St. Peter says, you know, you don't need anything in heaven. And the guy says, no, listen, he says, I prayed to God. We've got this covered. You know, God said, Hey, I could bring this with me. And St. Peter says, no, no, no. You really don't need anything in heaven. The guy says, no, I will not be happy unless I got my stuff with me. And, 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 and Peter says, well, what is so important that you had to bring to heaven? So the guy opens his suitcase and it's full of gold. I mean, just all kinds of, you know, bullion and, 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 you know, ingots of gold and bars of gold and stuff like that. And St. Peter looked at it and says, you brought pavement to heaven? You know, the streets are paved with gold, John says. I mean, really, from, from perspective, the things that we value some are meaningless. And Jesus, your soul is the most valuable thing you have. And so what would you give? In exchange for it. What is worth it? Now. The third point. Is that we need to examine. The excuses that keep Christ out. In Bethlehem they got. There's no room. There's no room. There's no vacancies. You know it's busy. That was the excuse he was given. By the time you read Matthew's gospel, some weeks have passed, probably some days have passed. And by this point in time, they're now in a house because when, the, when Matthew says when the wise men came to the house, they were at. So, so we know that they did, were able to upgrade after a few days, after a little while. But in Luke's gospel, there was no room. So people give excuses all the time for, for, for why... They don't let Christ in. Now, some people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not ready. You know, I, I'm not ready to, you know, when, when, when I'm ready, I, I'm going to, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm, I'm going to confess Jesus as my savior. I'll be buried with him in baptism. Or some people, well, other people, you know, there's a lot of hypocrites out there and I don't want to be a hypocrite. Some people say, well, you know, when I get this behind me or that behind me, you know, or when I think I can live right, I'll do it. Now, my issue with that is, you know, up to how well you live, it's on how much you can trust in Jesus. Put your faith in him. But what are the excuses that keep Christ out? In Acts chapter 24, Paul was preaching Actually, he was addressing the governor, Felix. And, and then uh, Felix and Drusilla, his wife, um, they heard Paul talk about his own conversion. No doubt Paul probably told him a little bit what happened to him on the road to Damascus. He was going to Damascus to persecute Christians and the Lord appeared to him. You know, And then he went and waited for three days. Then Ananias came to him. Paul was blind by this experience. And Nas came to him and says, Now, Brother Saul, why tearest thou? Arise, be baptized, washing away your sins. And so Paul was baptized. Immediately the, the, the scales came from his eyes and he could see again. And he went about to preach the gospel. But Felix says this. He was really moved by what Paul was saying. You know, uh, and, and Paul was talking about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Remember John? Jesus says, it's good that I leave because when I leave, the helper can come. And when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment to come. So this is what Felix's moment was. He was convicted of righteousness, Christ, not his own. He was convicted of judgment, you know, and about self-control. What's sin, but absence of self-control. So he's in aware of this. He's in the moment of the Holy Spirit is really pushing on him. What does he do? Go away. 
when I have a more convenient time, I will call for you. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit affect everybody with this awareness of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. But not to do what Felix said, not, not to look for a convenient time, because you know what? Becoming and being a Christian should never be a matter of convenience. It should be a convenient thing for you to do. It just convenient, and it should never be just convenient to be a Christian. It, it, it is the most precious name and identity in this world that you can possess. It's Christian. It's, it, it's more important than any political party affiliation. It's more important than, than where you went to school or what alumni you are. The most important identity. It's more important than degrees behind your name. It's more important than any kind of credential you have. It's more important than any kind of letters you can acquire. What's the most important thing in this world is that you are a Christian. most important thing to be a Christian to be in Christ and it should never be just a matter of convenience if you're a Christian you should be one 24 7 it's not something you just do on the first day of the week you show up and to, to have communion and to, to, to sing a few songs and, and to listen to a preacher in a red shirt I don't know it should be more than that. How many of you are familiar with this picture? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's two or three different versions of it. Um, the original one is is very old, uh, and um, and and my understanding is that when it was first produced, you know, people look at art critically, and someone pointed artists that. Um, you, you left something out. It's not an accurate rendering of the picture. And, and ha, I don't know if you've ever noticed what's missing in the picture. But, there, but it was pointed out to the artist that you, you left something out. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a good rendering on that picture. Have you ever noticed what's missing? There's no hand outside the door. It is a... Think of the door to your, the front door of your home not having a knob on the outside, you know, or, or lever. You know, there, the artist left. There was no way to open the door from the outside. You know, so, so well, you sort of made a mistake. You didn't put a door handle on it. You didn't put a you know, any way to get in the door. And the author said, "No." The artist said, "No, that's that's not the case. I did it exactly." How it's described is that this door can be only opened from the inside. It cannot be from the outside. So Jesus is at the door, but he's on the outside and he will not force his way in. He will not invite himself in. He stands at the door and knocks. I don't know how many times Luke doesn't tell us when we get to heaven, we can find out how many no doors did Joseph and Mary knock on? We need a room. No vacancies, no room. How, how many? I'm, I'm sure Joseph tried because his wife was heavy with child. He was trying to find the very best. How many times were they turned down? And so their son is born. And he comes into this world still knocking at the door, asking, do you have room for me? Do you have room for me? It's interesting that, that John records in the book of Revelation about a church. Actually, seven churches are mentioned. But this church in particular was the church of Laodicea. It was one of the Asian churches. And, and and Jesus tells John, I need for you to tell them something. And I really need for you to tell them something really important. 
Because the church of Laodicea, apparently one of the things that, that they produced there was an ISAV, you know, uh, and, and, and back years ago, um, treatment of eye ailments was really important. There wasn't a lot of advanced medical stuff, and so ointments and, and, and stuff were very important. So that's one of the things they produced there. They were somewhat wealthy, known for, for this medicinal stuff. And, and so they had sort of gotten complacent. And Jesus tells John to tell them this, I know your works. That you're neither hot, neither cold, nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus has had it with their lukewarmness. I don't know what whether it was their wealth that's sort of implied by the text or what it was that Jesus had lost priority, that Jesus had lost priority, that he had lost room in their hearts and their life. I don't know what had caused it for them to do that. I don't know whether they got busy. I don't know what they got wrapped up in that. But whatever reason, Jesus, listen, you're just, you're just a bunch of lukewarm people. And, and I just don't want you in my mouth. I, I, I vomit you out. The old King James says, I will spew you out of my mouth. But then he says this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. So back when that artist did that rendering, he has Revelation chapter 3 in mind. You have to let Jesus in. He's not going to force himself. John pretty much says in John chapter 16 that, you know, Jesus says that, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to convict people of three things of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And, and if you know that, that you know what sin is, and you know what true righteousness is, and that's not you being good, that's Jesus' righteousness, and you know there's a judgment to come, that's all you need to know. You know, you say, well, you know, it's just not convenient. It, it shouldn't have to be a decision based upon convenience. And so the question is this morning, you know, will you open the door? And for many of us as Christians, we've opened the door, but have we fully opened it? Have we really let Jesus affect every aspect of our life? Not just what we do here on Sunday mornings or, or Sunday nights or Wednesday night, but, but every aspect do I make decisions about what I spend my time doing? Well, do I make decisions about what I spend my money on? Do I make decisions of what I entertain myself with? Do I make decisions about, you know, who I spend time with, about what I do? And everything, you know, is, is do I have Christ-informed decisions in all areas of my life? Do I let Jesus have his proper place in my heart? And how far will you open the door? So as we bring this lesson to a close, I, I'm going to encourage you. Uh, I, I just don't put X for Christ. Let Christ stand. Christ. And, and as we look at the most important thing right now is not what's under the tree someplace, what yet there is on your list of things to do to get ready. The very most important thing at, at, at this moment in time is where are you in relationship to Christ Jesus? Don't don't let convenience be the reason that you don't make room for him. He stands at the door and knocks. The simple discussion this morning is, is about this, is that, you know, if you're here this morning and you've never convinced and convicted in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you are at this moment that you believe that Jesus is Lord, that you're willing to confess that, that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of the living God, and you die for your sins, and you're willing to be followed up by putting him on in baptism.
You've made room for Jesus. And let Him rule fully in your heart and your life and form it and Christ and form decisions in all that you do. You've made room for Him. And as we extend invitation this morning, what exactly do you intend to do? Brother Chris can lead us in the song this time. We can assist you once you come.